goodness from the University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. She will be giving us clever results of raw white gastric bypass on regulation of diabetes type 2 in patients with BMI above and below. Mm -hmm. Above 35. And below 35. Oh, oh, pardon me, I'm very really good. Right. Clinical and metabolic profiles of very severely obese pregnant women and their association with birth weight. Sorry about that. No, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Um, so, this is the uh, Queen's Medical Research Institute where I work in Edinburgh, and it's an unusually bright day on the picture. We're actually covered in, in snow at the moment in Scotland. So, many of you have listened today about definitions of obesity. And I think um, this has been obviously said on many occasions, an abnormal or excessive fat accumulation. And I think it's important to add that presents a risk to health. And that's the WHO definition, which I think is an extremely um, useful definition. Body mass index, you all understand how to calculate this. Um, now, the reason in northern European populations, these are obviously all ethnicity specific, the reason obesity is defined at this level for northern Europeans is because morbidity and mortality take off at this level. And this paper is actually concerned with women who are very severely obese, so this category here, with a bit body mass index of greater than 40. This is a paper by Hazelhurst et al, um, and it's from the UK, a population in the UK, over 38,000 women studied. And what it showed was that in parallel with this increase in obesity in the general population, there is this increase in obesity in women of childbearing age. And they projected quite correctly that by 2010, that number of women would be over 20%. Now many of you may be um, familiar as well with the fact that as body mass index increases, insulin sensitivity decrease, decreases in this curvilinear manner. Um, insulin sensitivity, remember, or rather insulin resistance, is the inverse of insulin sensitivity. So in other words, as body mass index increases, so too does insulin resistance. Pregnancy and birth weight. Pregnancy is actually physiologically an insulin resistant state. And there are obviously um, many benefits of it being an insulin resistant state. It is therefore um, associated with increased circulating levels of glucose, NIFA, triglycerides, etc., in the mother, which will go on then to um, provide fuel for the developing baby. Um, there was really a landmark paper called the Hyperglycemia in Pregnancy Outcome paper, which showed very clearly that maternal glucose concentrations at um, every stage of pregnancy are associated with birth weight. And that seminal paper actually led to gestational diabetes being reclassified. And now, um, from those classifications, we have a fasting plasma glucose of greater than or equal to 5.1 and a two hour of greater than or equal to 8.5 defining gestational diabetes. Um, other cross-sectional studies also show the potential importance of other metabolites such as uh, non-serified fatty acids and triglycerides. In um, the obese, um, overweight and normal weight women, it looks like pre-pregnancy BMI is independently associated with birth weight. Gestational weight gain is also associated with birth weight. Um, Women with class 3 obesity are not well studied. And this is what's called the Pedersen hypothesis or the expanded um, fetal growth hypothesis. And what it shows is that in the mother, decreased insulin actions, in other words, insulin resistance, 
is associated with increased circulating levels of glucose, non-esterified fatty acids, uh, triglycerides, amino acids. These then cross the placenta and what they do is they stimulate the fetal pancreas to produce in insulin. Now insulin is a growth factor and that then um, leads to um, adipose growth and deposition in the baby and that explains therefore this increased neonatal adiposity. So, um, just to recap, metabolism in pregnancy is complicated by very severe obesity, it's not well studied and the relationship of the metabolic variables, pre-pregnancy, body mass index, or rather sorry, uh, pregnancy BMI, booking, gestational weight gain um, and their associations with birth are not well studied. And so the aims of this study were to compare the metabolic profiles at booking, 16 weeks gestation, at 28 weeks and at 36 weeks gestation in these mothers versus control mothers who had a normal booking pregnancy BMI. And to ascertain which of these metabolites were most closely associated with birth weight in the, in, in the groups and to also ascertain which anthropometric variables were important in the individual groups. So the participants attended our um, research clinic at these various time points. They had their um, weight, body mass index and other personal data recorded. And at each of these visits, we determined fasting plasma glucose, non-esterified fatty acid levels, um, and insulin. We're in the process of working, uh, or looking through the triglycerides, so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have that data to hand here. All women, um, in line with the HAPO recommendations, have a 75 gram raw glucose tolerance test at 28 weeks gestation. Insulin sensitivity, we just used the linear homeostatic modeling assessment method. Obviously, um, babies have the birth weight recorded, gender, etc. And we did a series of statistical analyses, including logistic regression, um, adjusting for those maternal factors and those other factors which are known to influence birth weight. So these are the results. So in the control group, we had 109 women and 109 babies, obviously. And in the obese group, 239, these were very severely obese, I should say, 239 women with um, 239 babies. Um, all those mothers with pre-existing diabetes, hypertension, at booking were excluded and um, those uh, pregnancies which resulted in premature births um, or any that were complicated with uh, intrauterine growth retardation were also excluded from um, um, this analysis. So well matched in age and obviously by definition the obese um, weighed more and had greater BMIs. So 150 kilograms as a median BMI versus 62 in the controls. Um, the obese mothers were more Paris. We've got a very white population in Scotland um, and 97% of the controls were white and 94% um, of the obese mums were white. I mean there is one other thing really to say. I think that Southeast Asians would probably struggle to attain a BMI of 40. So we have very few Southeast Asians in that particular clinic. We have, um, we're seeing a lot more um, Afro-Caribbeans through the clinic. Smoking status, much greater in the obese. Social class, we use this uh, deprivation category. Um, the obese are more deprived. Um, and gestational diabetes, 11% in the obese versus 4.5% controls. And what you see here is that in the obese group, shown here in red, the infants born to them um, after adjustments 
are significantly heavier, very modestly so I have to say, uh, versus the control group. So here you can see 3.57 in the controls versus 3.63 kilograms in the obese. Um, many of you who do kind of antenatal clinics, there is um, some people define macrosomia or a large gestational age of, um, infant as greater than four kilograms. And here you can see that 17% of the controls had big babies versus 26% of the obese. So these absolute numbers are actually quite small. Um, and so I looked at the top turtle for birth weight as well. And so the, the numbers are sort of increasing. And so here you can see that 36% um, of the babies in the obese group were in this top turtle versus 26% and this was statistically significant. There was no difference in um, gestational age of the baby um, and no difference in uh, gender. So the next series of diagrams all look the same. Um, obese shown in red, controls in blue. And what you can see is, um, you know, there are these statistical differences obviously at any time point between the groups. But what's interesting is that with time, um, the uh, weight gain um, is significantly different and increases in the obese group. And similarly, in the control group, weight gain increases toward, from beginning to end of pregnancy. But gestational weight gain is actually greater in the control women. The, um, in the obese, again, remember none of these subjects have type 2 diabetes at Booking or any other form of diabetes. Um, okay, so obese mums again have greater glucose concentrations at every stage of pregnancy. Um, again, what's interesting is that that there is this change with time with glucose concentrations. You can see it going up at 28 weeks and then coming down in both groups. non sterified fatty acids, there's this reciprocal rela relationship really. There's this, um, uh, it actually comes down in both groups to tw at 28 weeks and then rises again. And that's significantly so. Um, insulin, Again, the obese mums are hyperinsulinemic compared to controls with changes over time. And if we look at changes in insulin sensitivity, insulin sensitivity diminishes um, from booking to 36 weeks in both groups. What's interesting is, and this has been published before by groups, is that there is this increase in insulin sensitivity in controls consistent perhaps with mum putting on more fat mass. So these are the results of logistic regression analysis and um, any number greater than one um, shows positive associations, between, it denotes a positive association between that factor and birth weight and any number less than one is indicative of a negative association. So just to um, go through these results, maternal weight is a risk factor in the control groups only for explaining increased birth weight. So if mum is heavy in this group only, um, then baby is heavy. Not so in, obese, in obesity. Um, gestational weight gain, again, important in the controls. In our particular series, not important in our women. There might be reasons that you can think of for that. Um, a unifying factor which is important in every pregnancy is actually insulin resistance. So the um, lower the insulin sensitivity, or rather the lower the insulin sensitivity, so the more insulin resistant the mum, the greater the birth weight of the baby. And glucose at 28 weeks is important in predicting birth weight in the obese group, but a low NIFA actually is possibly predictive of a high birth weight 
in the control group alone. So this might mean that these control women, these women of normal body mass index, are more reliant on this um, fatty acid um, utilisation at this time point. So in our clinic, weight gain is significantly greater in uh, uh, controls versus obese mums. Um, weight gain and BMI in controls only is associated with increased birth weight. Maternal obesity in pregnancy is associated with increased circulating metabolites versus control pregnancies. Um, insulin resistance increases by 36 weeks in both, in both groups. And this increased insulin resistance appears to be the kind of most important mechanism um, associated with increased birth weight. And um, there are positive associations between 28 week glucose and birth weight in obese mums only. And um, this maternal NEFA concentrations I've shown you decrease at 28 weeks in both groups. Um, but it's only in the control group that this low maternal NEFA concentration is associated with increased birth weight in the controls only. And weight and weight gain appear more important in the control women um, and the maternal hypoglycemia in pregnancy influences birth weight in the class 3 obese mums and as I said does this indicate uh, a possible increased reliance on NEFA metabolism in the controlled pregnancies. And we're actually looking, we, we, we're very lucky because um, we've actually got in parallel to the research clinic where we can't really decipher a lot of these mechanisms, we've got parallel animal studies as well. And um, we've started uh, stable isotope studies where we can actually then sample um, placenta, etc. So, thank you. That's it. Any questions or comments? Yes, I, I was wondering if you've had a chance to follow up with the babies after six months or 12 months and, and to, to look at how they're growing and whether there's an impact of this. Yes. We're doing that now. We're doing that now, actually. We haven't had a chance to analyse it, but um, all the babies um, go into an instrument called a pea pod at birth and then, a, 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 and then at three months um, and then they get, you know, there's a lot of um, questionnaires and um, we're assessing uh, nutrition and um, other different aspects. So yes, we're, an important part of the program is following up the babies. My observation, very good presentation, well done. From the surgical perspective and what we have observed in strictly restrictive procedures, we've noticed that insulin resistance goes down initially, and we've attributed this to the decreased caloric intake. Looking at your presentation, it appears to me that the obese patients don't seem to change their caloric intake, whereas the normal size patients increase their caloric intake. Yeah. And therefore, by increasing the calorie intake, stimulates the incretins in the duodenal axis, which produces insulin resistance. I just want you to think about that. Um, I should say, this is a, a, a research clinic, and the women are actually seen a lot. And um, there's also um, a dietitian attached to the clinic, and we wonder whether having all that extra input actually limits, possibly limits some of their weight gain. But there is also the other fact that I think if you are of a, if you are very obese, then maybe it is more difficult to gain more weight. a lot of extra weight. And remember that insulin resistance is actually a mechanism for limiting weight gain. That's why people feel that, you know, historically maybe that was actually um, the use of it, if you like. <laughs> yes, sir? I may have missed that, but uh, what is the insulin sensitivity status of the babies that are born from the control and the obese? We, um, we haven't, um, I'm, I'm not sure if we've, we've possibly collected that information, because we seem to collect everything on these babies, um, and I don't know. Um, 
Looking at the preliminary results, though, it's quite interesting because, that, I mean, you saw that there's only a very modest difference in birth weight. And when we looked at the PPOD, we, we look at the PPOD studies, but that measures um, adiposity. It's the most accurate measurement of adiposity um, by displacement plethysmography, it's called. And um, there's no significant difference at the moment in adiposity between the two groups. Maybe we're underpowered, but, but, not, but not at the moment. And, or maybe it's nutritional, you know, maybe with the nutritional advice that's given, maybe we're just, we're kind of a different clinic to most clinics. Thank you very much. The next presenter, uh, I will talk to about Deborah. Is she here now? Yes, okay, I'd like to introduce at this time my colleague, Dr. Rajiv Spola from Delhi, from the Max Healthcare Institute in Delhi.